Okay, Dr. Pavlik, we may begin. Thank you, Aido. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and especially good evening. So today we are gathered all around the world, it seems. A very warm welcome from the Traces Asia Laboratory to our third archaeology webinar series at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. As always, this webinar is jointly hosted and facilitated by Aido Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rixar Fuentes, and myself. The webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, and the RIT and its Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. Neanderthals and us, Kissing Kin or Adversaries. This is the title of an exciting lecture on the deep human history in our webinar today. Presented by an outstanding scientist, Professor Emeritus Jeffrey Schwartz. Professor Schwartz is a physical anthropologist at the departments of anthropology and history and philosophy of science of the University of Pittsburgh, where he teaches physical anthropology, human origins and human evolution. He's also a research associate of the Division of Anthropology of the American Museum of Natural History in New York and a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, where he was actually its first elected president from 2008 to 2012. He has done extensive fieldwork in the United States, in England, Israel, Cyprus, and Tunisia, and museum research in the mammal and vertebrate paleontology collections of museums across the world. Professor Schwartz is recognized worldwide as one of the most important anthropologists of our time and is internationally known for his evolutionary biological studies and theories on the early development of primates and on the phylogeny of humans. He is the author of several books that are standard literature in evolutionary biology such as the four volume set, the human fossil record, extinct humans, the red ape, orangutans and human origins, and what the bones tell us. I'd like to thank Mylene very much who was able to invite Professor Schwartz for our webinar. And Mylene has to say a few more words uh, about Dr. Schwartz. Thank you, Mylene. Thank you. Alfred, good morning, everyone. Good evening, Jeff. Uh, so as Alfred mentioned, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz is no doubt one of the top paleoanthropologists of our time. Uh, when I knew I was going to meet him or have a chance to meet him at a conference in Tbilisi in 2016, I wanted to take along with me one of his books so that I could ask him to sign it. But if I had brought along just even just one of uh, his human fossil records volume. It would have taken up all of my baggage uh, allowance. So I wasn't able to do that. But luckily, Jeff turns out to be a very accommodating person and uh, he, who also has a, in, an interest in studying the fossils in the Philippines. And he's been planning on coming uh, to the Philippines since. And we've helped him apply uh, for the National Museum to be a National Museum Research Associate, um, which I think is uh, it's about time to renew it again, Jeff, right? Yes, yeah. and you so, yeah. so we're hoping to see Jeff in person uh, by the end of this year or next year. Meanwhile, we are so fortunate and we are so grateful to have him with us, albeit online, uh, here on the DSA webinars. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for being with us. And now I turn you over to Dr. Rixar Fuentes. Thank you. Thanks, Maylene. So for the abstract of this talk, um, although claims of frequent Neanderthal human interbreeding always make the news, the question is, is this supported by morphological, paleontological, or molecular evidence? Were Neanderthals and contemporaneous Homo sapiens in frequent proximity, or even in the same geographical regions? Would males of one species and females of the other have even crossed paths? And if they had, would males or females of Neanderthals and of Homo sapiens have even perceived the other as potential mates? 
Professor Schwartz doubts this. Neanderthals and contemporaneous Homo sapiens were so morphologically different, they would likely have reacted to the other in disbelief, if not fear and repulsion. Further, there is mounting evidence that intersecting Neanderthal groups engaged not only in violence, but in cannibalism, since fear of the other or xenophobia still characterizes human behavior, it would probably have been magnified if members of each of these two species had met up. As for DNA, a major question is, are these similarities molecular anthropologists claim that demonstrate Neanderthal human interbreeding uniquely shared by the two species? Professor Schwartz also doubts this. First, all DNA typically degrades by 100,000 years, which is why molecular anthropologists have not been able to extract DNA from most of the fossils we know and will never be able to do so for the vast majority of the specimens that will be discovered in the future. Second, since we will never know the full picture of any group's evolution, we will never know how many species of human relatives existed. Together, this means we can never demonstrate that the bits and pieces of DNA Neanderthals and humans share were not also part of the genomes of other human species, and thus not reflective of an evolutionary or sexual intimacy between the two species. Again, we welcome everyone and Dr. Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey H. Schwartz, the floor is now yours. Thank you all for the invitation and these very kind words. And um, thank you all uh, who are joining in for doing so. So um, I am going to try to, to oh, I get it, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, so anyway, the title of my talk, as you heard, is Neanderthals and us, are we kissing kin, were we kissing kin, or adversaries? So um, you can read along. I thought it would be worthwhile for me to write out what I'll be saying, and I can elaborate on it or change it a bit, but at least you'll have this. So although what we know is DNA was chemically identified in the 1860s. It was only in, in the 1950s that the composition of DNA began to be understood. However, since these studies were based on bacteria, which are single cells with one circular chromosome, it was not until the 1990s that the technology to directly sequence the DNA of complex animals like us was possible. Unlike bacteria, our cells possess two kinds of DNA. One kind is housed in the nucleus of our cells, nuclear or N DNA. In complex animals, again like us, nuclear DNA is distributed among our chromosomes. In fact, they are our chromosomes. The other kind of DNA is housed in the hundreds, sometimes even thousands of minuscule organelles called mitochondria that lie outside the nucleus in the cell. This DNA is called mitochondrial or MT DNA. Each mitochondrion houses hundreds of single circular mitochondrial DNA chromosomes. While each parent contributes half its DNA to their offspring, mitochondrial DNA is supposedly passed only from mothers to their offspring. And if anybody would like to discuss this later on, that would be great because I'm not going to dwell on it here. Since the 1990s, molecular anthropologists have interpreted similarities between our nuclear DNA and Neanderthal DNA as indic indicating that our two species interbred multiple times over thousands of years. And this is one of the uh, popularized uh, illustrations meeting up. And if you were to do an online search of these things, you would see oftentimes that the Neanderthal counterpart is made to look more like us and in fact, I think is warranted. Okay. So here I will explore the questions, do paleontological, archeological, and ethnological studies support the scenario of human Neanderthal interbreeding? If they cross paths with their interaction have led to mutually gratifying sex, would one have even recognized the other as a potential mate? <clears throat> 
So in order to better explore this topic, we must first turn to the history of paleontology or paleoanthropology. And I, I do this because the history of our discipline is so poorly known and not referred to so that why we have the ideas that we have or why we think we have the ideas we have, uh, the history of how it got to us is often overlooked. So let's explore this. So actually it was Otto Schmerling in the uh, early part of the 1800s who found some uh, remains that he thought were actually the remains of ancient humans. And this was um, controversial, uh, although it never got off the ground, because at the time thinking was dominated by creationism and a direct um, uh, reading of gen Genesis. So it was not until actually 1856 when the fellow of grotto Neanderthal specimen was found and miners turned it over to a local school teacher, Fulrot, that this debate about human antiquity um, began. Fulrot gave the specimen to Germany's premier human anatomist, Hermann Schaffhausen. He claimed they're not ancient, but the remains of a crazed Cossack. Thomas Henry Huxley, one of Charles Darwin's colleagues, accepted the antiquity of the specimen, but declared it an ancient race that morphed into the most primitive extant race, which for him were Australian Aborigines. William King also accepted the antiquity of the Feldhofer Neanderthal, but rejected Huxley's notion of Neanderthal as extinct human race. Instead, in 1865, King created the first species name for an extinct human relative, Homo neanderthalensis. Now, King was an experienced paleontologist and taxonomist, and he named numerous vertebrate and invertebrate species, as well as many genera, and genera is the plural of, species, of genus. However, again, uh, given the considerable creationist opposition to evolution at the time, just naming Homo neanderthalensis was bold indeed. But perhaps more interesting, at least for me in the historical side, is King's comment at the end of his article. I now feel strongly inclined to believe that it, the Neanderthal, is not only specifically as in species, but generically as in genus, distinct from man. So even though there were different ideas on as um, human evolution as more fossils were found, there were always people who questioned the uh, close, a close relationship between humans and Neanderthals. So Sally Zuckerman was one of um, Britain's uh, premier paleoanthropologists, and there were some others in the United States as well who questioned um, Neanderthals belonging with us. So Zuckerman wrote in 1933, the species Homo neanderthalensis was created by King, who seems to have believed that the characters of the Neanderthal brain case were so peculiar that they almost justified generic, as in genus, recognition. But in view of the strong bias against admitting human evolution that existed when he wrote, it is not surprising that he chose to regard the Neanderthal remains as those of a new species of Homo, rather than an altogether new kind of man. So Zuckerman concluded that article from 1933, basically saying inconsistencies, inconsistencies arising in the classification of hominidae uh, and what you call homo, hominins now, we were calling hominids with a D back then. And I think we should, if you wanna discuss that, are due largely to the inclusion of Neanderthal man in the genus Homo the arbitrariness of which is amply demonstrated by history. So again, people are pointing out that just because Neanderthals were put in our genus, there wasn't a justification for that. So Zuckerman, at the, in a, at the time, the Australopithecus kinds of specimens from South Africa were not universally accepted as human relatives. So Zuckerman was talking about the known specimens, which included from Java Pithecanthropus, China Sinanthropus, Neanderthals, of course, and a specimen of Broken Hill Zambia, which was the species Rhodesiensis. That he considered to be one morphological group versus another morphological group, which was extant humans and our lookalike upper Paleolithic uh, 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 humans as well. <clears throat> 
Those were the only ones that Zuckerman thought should be in the genus Homo. By 1949, no fewer than 12 new species and 90 genera of extinct hominid had been named. And this is quite a lot of them. And I noticed when I was re reading this before or, uh, now, there are a few little errors, but nonetheless. So blue are new genus names. The purples are new species names. Um, yellow is when it's a genus or a species has been repeated. And on the right-hand side is the author or discoverer of the specimens and the year in which this, the name was created. So there were quite a lot. These days, however, only early hominins are allowed to be allocated to different genera, such as Aurorans, Solanthropus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Kenyanthropus. So why is everything else placed in genus Homo? And part of the answer comes from Theodosius Dobjansky. Now, Dobjansky was the geneticist of the what's called the modern evolutionary synthesis. And he began talking about human evolution in an article he published in 1944, and then he published many more afterwards. Well, one thing he started off with, which is correct, is that modern man is a single species consisting of imperfectly differentiated races. Now, differentiated means something in terms of the synthesis, because they promoted the idea that species could only emerge once a parent population was subdivided into daughter populations and they diverge from one another. Nonetheless, he continued. And again, he had no firsthand knowledge of the human fossil record, but he went on to make this unfounded assertion. While human races may have initially begun to diverge, civilization has very early reversed the process via gradual and then rapid gene exchange. So he's making a claim based on nothing that Perhaps early on, the human lineage had began to diverge, but that was reversed and gene exchange keeps them all together. So they're never gonna diverge, never speciate. And this is where the idea of a single transforming or morphing lineage comes from. Now, Devjansky then turned to specimens from Israel, which again, he had never studied, <clears throat> from caves from Mount Carmel in Israel in the North. Sir Arthur Keith and T.D. McCown were uh, charged with uh, analyzing these remains. And there was a, a pretty complete Neanderthal skeleton from Taboon Cave, and that's the skull on the left, which they placed in the genus and species Paleoanthropus neanderthalensis. At another cave nearby, School Cave, there was a different kind of hominin, which they placed, or actually Keith did before, in Paleoanthropus palestinus. Now, again, without any basis, in fact, Dobjansky tastes, takes these specimens, and I think because they come from sites that are within spitting distance of one another. When I visited those sites, they were like 100 meters apart, tops. Since the Mount Carmel specimens must reflect gene flow via hybridization of a Neanderthaloid and a modern type, they cannot be separate species. Thus, the apparent replacement in Europe of morphologically Neanderthal by morphologically modern, that is Upper Paleolithic man, is not one of one species replacing another. Rather, differences between taboon and school specimens reflect differential expression within species sapiens of inherent genetic variation. So here we have the collapsing of these very, very different um, fossils into the same egg basket. So even though he began with the unfounded assertion that we are one single transforming lineage, he concludes the same assumption is that as far as known, no more than a single hominid existed at any one time level. Enter Ernst Meyer, who was the self-appointed taxonomist of the modern evolutionary synthesis. And in 1950, he decided to take on human evolution. Again, and this he actually admitted uh, in that article without firsthand knowledge of the fossils. Now, Meyer was the one who came up with the notion of this diverging uh, daughter populations eventually becoming species. But he was also sort of fixated on the notion of the genus, which is relevant here. The genus is not merely a morphological concept, concept. It is a very distinct biological meaning. Species united in the given genus occupy an ecological situation, which is different from that occupied by the species of another genus. <clears throat> 
So since at the time all hominins were supposed to be similarly bipedal and could exploit the same ecological situations, Meyer lumped them all into the genus Homo and into three time successive transforming species. So this is what it looked like. So the earlier material, which was then only known from South Africa, was all lumped into the species Transvalensis. Somehow that morphed into this very variable species called Homo erectus, which morphed into another variable species, Homo sapiens. Now what this does by putting all these things there, it diminishes the potential of taxonomically and phylogenetically relevant morphology, which could lead to hypotheses of species and their relationships, it reduces that diversity to individual variations. So everything that's under one of these species umbrellas is a variant of the other in this mindset. And that's the mindset that informed paleoanthropology for decades and still in many ways does. So again, like Dujansky started off with assumption then he ended with assumption Meyer is, this is an incredible sentence for me, having asserted that there was only one hominid at any point in time, he remarks in apparent surprise, why primitive man should have been more variable than modern man is not entirely clear. How ironic. So by the 1970s, we were sort of looking at this perception of human evolution. Uh, in part, Meyer in the 1960s admitted that maybe the earlier material should be its own genus. So all those specimens were lumped into the genus Australopithecus and different species. The Leakeys had found specimens they were calling Homo habilis, and that, that had just been plunked into the genus Homo. Now the scenario was something Homo habilis gave rise to this hugely variable, very geographically widespread Homo erectus that morphed into this very variable uh, sort of uh, widespread Homo sapiens. It's interesting though, because even though paleoanthropologists accepted this linear notion of Jansky and Meyer, they still agree that Neanderthals and humans were very different morphologically. So here is an illustration from an article in the late 1970s, Neanderthal on the left, of course. And that you can see right off the bat, even in this line drawing, the difference in the skull shape, the Neanderthal is a longer skull, it's a lower skull, it's got some brow development, the mandibles are different, the lower jaws are different. And that triangle that you see in each one, the more spacious that triangle, more enlarged it is, the greater the protrusion of the face in front of the brain case. So Neanderthals have these very anteriorly uh, projecting faces. So Neanderthals are on the left in these comparisons. Uh, just to sort of show you, long Neanderthal skull, this um, brow ridge which arches over each orbit and then connects across over the nose, which has been referred to basically like the McDonald's double arches, and this very, very long um, snout. If you look at them from the front, you can see the Neanderthal skull is lower and wider. And um, you can feel this on yourself. If you pinch on the either side of your um, upper jaw, you can feel that you're under your cheekbones. But if you were a Neanderthal, the bone would go directly down from the cheekbone to the, um, to the upper jaw itself. Looking at the rear, Neanderthals are all described as having semi sort of circular brain cases in rear profile. That means the suture at the back of the skull has a different configuration than us with our more straight-sided vaulted um, brain case. Uh, the next arrow down is pointing to where our neck muscles attach. And you can see in Neanderthals, it's straight across in us. It looks like, a bow, uh, like an arrow. It points down. And again, the wider Neanderthal skull. This is also from that article, and the pink um, uh, part of this illustration is the human condition, and we're looking at the pelvis. Now, the pelvis is also called the os coxa, which you can see below, and part of the uh, components of the os coxa is the pubic bone, or pubis. And if you can see uh, in, the, uh, in, in the drawing with, uh, that is above the word human, uh, when you get to our, the midline, our pubic area is very small and stubby. Uh, 
But if you look at the pubis of the Neanderthal that I have photographed there, you can see that it's very tall. And if we had a different view of it, we would see that it's very thin instead of, instead of stubby. So the whole configuration of the pelvis of Neanderthals is very different from humans. And that means something about the way they moved. Neanderthals have relatively the longest clavicle of any primate, which means that their shoulders are farther apart than any other primate. In the hand, the uh, bones at the ends of the fingers and the thumb are compressed and rounded, almost like the pads on a tree frog's uh, toes. And you can see the thumb, which is to your left, um, goes all the way up past the first knuckle, almost to the second joint of your index finger. And if you look at that reconstructed Neanderthal, which is made from different bits and pieces of uh, Neanderthal skeletons to make this composite, you get a sense of this chunky sort of um, hominid. And in this uh, illustration, the same skeleton that we just saw is compared to a human skeleton that was chosen because of the same height. Um, Neanderthals would have been shorter or these Homo sapiens would have been taller. But you can see they look very different, different hips, different rib cage, farther shoulders, different proportions of the limbs, which means they walked and in general, they just moved differently. So even though this might be sort of, you know, the muscle man version of a Neanderthal, it does point out um, how they would have differed if you put soft tissue on those bones. Big broad shoulders, huge deltoid muscles, big chest or pectoral muscles, shorter and wider humerus or upper arm versus these longer um, muscular lower arms that are curved because of the uh, stress of the muscles on the bone. You can also see that the very long thumb that these individuals had, broad hips, the quads in the thigh would have been huge. And you can see the shorter lower legs. So everything about this in Neanderthal is, I think, unique to it. So I'll just ask you this question to think about, would you find this individual attractive? Or if this was the female version, would you figure it attractive? However you want to look at this. So even at a distance, as a silhouette on the horizon, would you think it's like you? Just think about that. So eventually, paleoanthropologists began to realize that these differences uh, within species sapiens probably reflected different species. So Neanderthals were returned to their original species Homo neanderthalensis, and everything else that looked primitive or archaic was placed into Homo heidelbergensis. Again, there's this linear notion that you're going from the early hominids through Homo habilis to this weird Homo erectus, and then basically up to Homo sapiens. And you can see at the bottom, uh, now the early hominids, which we now know at this time from East Africa as well, are placed in different genera. So it's okay to have different genera early on, but not when you get to us. Nevertheless, and I think this is why the history is important, because Neanderthals had been placed in our species for so many decades, the notion of them being one with us, our closest relative or ancestor, was so entrenched in scenarios of human evolution that anything Neanderthal, molecules or morphology, was considered the state from which its human counterpart evolved. And that goes back to Sully Zuckerman's thing about the inconsistencies or do the arbitrariness with which fossils were put in the genus Homo. So we can talk more about the molecules later on uh, during question period if you want. As for the molecules, Neanderthal nuclear DNA is taken as the primitive sequence from which our nuclear DNA evolved. So uh, we can talk about the primitive sequence of the chimpanzee and all this other stuff on the slide, but what's important is because the Neanderthal sequence is taken as primitive from which our sequence um, emerged or evolved, when you find similarity between Neanderthal and human DNA, that's considered to be reflective of interbreeding. Now, nuclear DNA has been extracted only from a few upper Paleolithic humans, some Neanderthals, a partial finger bone and a few teeth from Denisova Cave in Siberia, a specimen for China, one from Mongolia and two bones from Spain, which is less than 1% of the known human fossil record. So this slide is not 
contain all the specimens of hominins that we know. But it does give you the, um, I, the, 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 the comparison. The specimens in the squares are the ones from which uh, DNA has been extracted. Uh, and we have no DNA from any of these others and we will never have them because DNA usually degrades by 100,000 years and we'll never know more than 1% of the human fossil record from their genome as well as their morphology. So, and this means we'll never know how many other hominin species had the same bits and pieces of nuclear DNA that's supposedly shared exclusively by humans and Neanderthals and which are interpreted as demonstrating their interbreeding. Further, the fossil evidence does not support a sister species relationship between humans and Neanderthals, which would be or you would expect it to be. Rather, each species had other hominins that were more closely related to it. So here are some specimens. Uh, the one on um, Cima de los Huesos is from Spain. The two others are from Germany. And the one on uh, the lower left is from India. And you can just see that there are specimens that I think uh, can arguably be uh, suggested as species whose relationships are close to Neanderthals. On the other hand, and this doesn't include all the specimens that I think belong to the sapiens group or clade, there is a bunch of specimens that I think represent different species that are more closely related to us than to Neanderthals. So we're not that closely related, at least as far as I think the fossils tell us. But these facts are ignored or even not considered by paleoanthropologists and those who accept without question the infallibility of molecular anthropologists' speculations. So let's look at the assumptions that must be accepted in order to argue that humans and Neanderthals did interbreed over thousands of years. In order to interbreed with some regularity, human and Neanderthal ranges must have intersected, that at least abutted one another or overlapped. Now, molecular anthropologists claim that most of these interbreeding events took place in Asia. However, while there are some, but not many Asian specimens of Homo sapiens, there are no Neanderthal specimens. And as for Europe, it's pretty spotty as well, or even dubious. There's a site in France, Le Roi, and, um, who's, uh, and I've studied this material as well. Um, there is a partial Homo sapiens mandible and a smaller fragment that may be a Neanderthal mandible. What, if that's true, what's interesting is that this, the possible Neanderthal mandible has cut marks on it, which suggests cannibalism, that Homo sapiens gnawed on this Neanderthal, if that's true. From this newer site in France, there are supposedly four successive waves of Neanderthal and humans coming into this cave site. Neanderthal, human, Neanderthal, human which suggests there wasn't any contact between the species because there is no evidence of cultures or, or bones. And in fact, this the conclusion is being questioned by a lot of other archeologists. So Europe is not a very good example. However, interbreeding or what we would call hybridization is commonplace between very morphologically similar sister species with long standing contact between or overlapping of their ranges. For example, species of, mount, of hares from Scandinavia, species of vole, tree frog, beetle, deer. And I could have put on a whole list, but I think the point is made that very morphologically similar species with contacts between their ages uh, do interbreed. But that doesn't seem to be the case either morphologically or archeologically with humans and Neanderthals. In addition, for Neanderthals and us to have a history of interbreeding, males and females of each species must have crossed paths with some regularity. The question is, my question is, would they have done so? I doubt it. Neanderthals, like other hominins, including upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens, would have been hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers form small, often nomadic groups. So in hunter-gatherer societies, small bands of men go off, look, sometimes far afield from their home base, uh, looking for prey to hunt. Women and children stay closer to home base, foraging for edible plants, invertebrates, and small vertebrates. 
Oops. What this means is if different hunter-gatherer groups were to cross paths, it would be males encountering other males, more than likely. As demonstrated by lots of ethnological studies and from an uh, uh, one very good archeological study and uh, site in Egypt, when these male groups do cross paths, uh, and this must be for the, you know, I'm saying this for the, the extant humans, uh, they don't just say hi and move on. However, ethnological and archeological studies do show that when these male hunting groups intersect, the result is interpersonal violence which makes sense if hunting parties are competing for the same, especially scarce resources. And here is the photo of a skull of a male hunter-gatherer that had been clobbered to death in one of these interpersonal uh, um, interactions. And there's also increasing evidence of Neanderthal cannibalism. Neanderthals cannibalizing other Neanderthals, probably when food was scarce. And I don't know if you can read it, but everything, uh, the uh, blue underline and the yellow and all of that um, are, are pretty good cases uh, for Neanderthal cannibalism. Now, this also makes sense because if like present day hunter gatherers, different Neanderthal groups were competing for the same scarce food resources, why not eat the Neanderthal who also wants to eat your food? So to summarize, Neanderthals present a suite of morphological features not seen in other hominins, which means their features are not primitive relative to or ancestral to ours. Based on fossils, Neanderthals and humans are not sister species. Other hominins are more closely related to each of them. Claims that nuclear DNA demonstrates Neanderthal human interbreeding is contradicted by studies on mitochondrial DNA, which have been interpreted as showing no evidence of interbreeding, which is something that's not in the popular press. The one set of DNA gives one result and the other a totally contradictory one. Claims that, Neander that nuclear DNA demonstrates Neanderthal human interbreeding over thousands of years are based on few specimens and assumptions not supported paleontologically, archeologically, or ethnologically. So in conclusion, if a Neanderthal and a human of the opposite sex did meet up, would they have recognized each other as potential mates? I doubt it. So thank you for your kind attention. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Schwartz. Thank you for this wonderful talk and for your insights and, and the lot of information that you presented on Neanderthals and on us and, and on the entire history of uh, the discipline. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we, we have uh, several questions uh, from the audience. Um, but may I, may I just start with... Uh, asking, what, what do you think, why is the idea of, of interbreeding between Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens uh, now so popular despite the, the, the obviously very fragmentary record? Well, um, a molecular biologist I know came up with an interesting way of sort of uh, a phrase to capture this. And he, call, he says, it's the tyranny of the genome. And what he means by that is that going back to the 1950s, uh, when bacterial DNA was being um, understood, the phrase DNA is the blueprint of life took on a life of its own. And all the studies subsequently were trying to get at the DNA itself in ourselves and other complex animals. So I think that with that sort of weight, um, I'm studying the DNA and you're not. 
it sort of carries uh, more than looking at the fossils. And if you look at the, if you, uh, I'm sure you all know some of the literature, is that people interpreting the human fossil record and human evolution try to put it into, into the framework that molecular anthropologists uh, provide. Um, I have to tell you, I don't think molecular anthropologists really know about evolutionary things. I don't think they understand evolutionary theory or how to do the phylogenetic reconstructions. Um, but again, I think it's just the tyranny of the genome. People are afraid to question the DNA. And um, unfortunately, what this really requires, and I've spent a lot of time doing this, you actually have to just go word by word by word in every one of these molecular articles to see what they're saying. And then to go to the molecular literature on, done by people who are, really don't care about humans and Neanderthals to actually see what the rest of the world, the uh, life is like in terms of their interactions. Did that clarify anything? Well, it, yeah, it certainly gives gives an idea. So, uh, geneticists and and uh, molecular anthropology is is leading the debate. It it seems. Yes, um, I I can't fight that, and. Um, all I can say is that if you just look at the broader literature, um, beyond the, the claims about human evolution, it really is an eye opener. There's a whole different world, a much more complex molecular world out there. I published a big, I was invited to write a review. I've, I've been invited to write review articles on molecular systematics for 20 years now. And I started writing about this and thinking about it when I wrote The Red Ape and other articles in the 1980s. So I was invited to write a review article on mitochondrial DNA. And coming from philosophy and history of science, you have to go back into the original thing. And you know, mitochondrial DNA is widely accepted as being passed on only from mothers to their offspring. But there's no place in the literature that actually demonstrates that. If you go through the literature on mitochondrial DNA, going all the way back to the 1600s with Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of the first really usable microscope, and the earlier studies on mitochondria, mitochondria the stuff that holds the DNA, the hypothesis should have been that mitochondrial DNA can be passed on from fathers and it can recombine with maternal mitochondrial DNA. And there is just a whole library of, of publications on non-human animals that demonstrate the contribution of paternal DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA to offspring. But the few cases where this is not true in fruit flies, uh, some in a species of mouse, and uh, a little sort of ancestral vertebrate called the tunicate. This is, these are cases where in fact maternal uh, inheritance is strict. But otherwise, if you look at the literature, uh, there's paternal, what they call paternal leakage or, trans, uh, or, or transmission. So I'm not, a, I'm not excluding the molecular information. I just think that one has to bring all of the information to bear, not just what's presented about humans. And one has to look at it from a theoretical perspective and a philosophical perspective as well, which is how do we interpret anything, whether they be molecules or bones or fossils in a phylogenetic or evolutionary sense. Thank you very much. Uh, before we... Uh, maybe ask for, for questions from the audience. Um, may I ask uh, a, another question? Um, I, I remember it was a, uh, several years ago, 10 years ago, um, I, I met in, in Bonn at the Landes Museum uh, in Germany, I met Eric Trinkhaus, who was mm -hmm. working on the, on the double burial 
of the Bonn Oberkassel site. Um, while, while I was at the same time working on the stone tools and uh, I, I, do, I do not really know uh, a lot about fossil bones. Uh, I'm, I'm more into stone tools and, and uh, prehistoric technologies. But I, I remember, and, and it, it came to my mind when, when you uh, showed that the different appearances, that the different build movements uh, of, of Neanderthals compared to, to Homo sapiens. Uh, Eric Trinkhaus told me, uh, one of the talks we had, that um, the anatomical difference between Pleistocene and Holocene Homo sapiens would be actually greater than between Neanderthals and, and early Homo sapiens. Uh, I hope I got that more or less right, uh, but would you agree to that? Or, or how can we imagine that even, or put it into well, context? Well, that, so that sounds like Eric Trinkhaus. And so I think you got right. it right, but he's wrong. Um, one of the parts of this history that, you know, there are lots of parts to this history I, I couldn't do in that period, in this talk. Um, well, one thing I guess I'll sort of reemphasize is because Neanderthals were originally placed in the genus Homo, and there's this whole sort of history of Neanderthals being kept in the genus Homo, it's sort of instilled this notion that uh, they're very close to us. And even in the, in the older, what, what started to happen when Neanderthals and this uh, Heidelbergensis materials were still included in Sapiens was a certain language appeared in the literature to try to account for the differences between Neanderthals, Heidelbergensis things and us. And so the words archaic, Homo sapiens and anatomically modern Homo sapiens came into the literature. So as that, those drawings that I showed you from that article, uh, Eric co-authored. So everybody could say, yes, these are distinctive Neanderthal fossils. And if I fell over a fossil in the street, I could tell if it was a Neanderthal because they're so blatantly different or unique in their own features. But because of this notion that there's this intimacy, phylogenetic intimacy between Neanderthals and us, um, people have been searching for Neanderthal features in um, pre-present day humans. And part of this is they wanna sort of minimize the differences between Neanderthals and us. And one of the ways you can do that is by saying, if you compare modern day humans with Homo sapiens from the past, uh, the difference between them is greater than it is between us and Neanderthals. That's it, one of the ways you can get, a, get around those very, the differences. Even today, although Neanderthals are, uh, most people refer to them in the species Neanderthalensis, people still use archaic and anatomically modern. Now, you would never refer to archaic versus anatomically modern Tyrannosaurus rex. You just wouldn't do that with any other organism. So there's this really strange anthropocentric idiosyncrasy about the way in which the human fossil record has been approached. Now, some of these Pleistocene Homo sapiens, um, I don't think are Homo sapiens. And that's part of the problem because it, in that history, um, with all of that stuff being lumped into Homo sapiens, so that it, this, this wastebasket became so enlarged and bloated that people couldn't no longer say that Neanderthals were one of us and Heidelbergensis was one of us. Um, I got so excited, I forgot what I was saying. Um, <laughs> um, I sort of forgot what I was saying, but in any case, um, People keep looking for Neanderthal features in humans and vice versa to show this uh, su supposed continuity. I lost my train of thought, but I, I hope you got excited for a moment as well. Very uh, much, and it, it's there. It, it wasn't completely lost, it was there. No, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh... Of course, I, I, I should have probably also mentioned that it, it was not during the day, it was quite uh, on, uh, at the end of a long day and, and we, we spent 
dinner and, and had a few drinks afterwards in a, in a very nice Bavarian uh, restaurant in, in, in the center of Bonn uh, when, when we had this, this conversation. And I, I found it quite uh, interesting. But at, at the same time, and, and you pointed it out uh, just a, a moment ago, um, we, we seem to, 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 to look at, at our species very differently than, than all other animals. That is true. That is very true. So um, one of the reasons I did the Human Fossil for Record project or proposed it was um, because I was having, having difficulty, difficulty teaching and the students having real objective information they could work with and think about. So if you read a, a lot of the papers, I would say like 99% um, on human evolution intertwine a scenario with the data. So it's very difficult to tease apart the data from the scenario. And so when I would ask students, choose a topic. What, what, what about the species of uh, Australopithecus africanus or all the species that are now lumped into Australopithecus? What do you think? And the only way you can start to think about that is to have access to the, something about the fossils. And that's very difficult to get from the publications. So I wanted to do this encyclopedic work, which with, which I did the photographs all the same way, the descriptions all the same way. My colleague Tattersall did the history. I put the stuff together phylogenetically. So the interpretation was always separate from the description and the historical context of the specimens. So that these descriptions and the, and the photos would be available to anyone, a student, professor, anybody who wanted to um, try to think about it themselves. So, there's a lot to there's a lot to untangle um, in this general area of human evolution. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, um, Jeff. I, I would have a, a few more questions, but perhaps uh, we we ask the audience uh, if if they would have uh, any questions or comments. Uh, Aido, may I turn over to you? All right, so at the moment, oh, we do not have questions from the audience, but oh, we have a question from um, Ma'am Mylene. Go ahead, Ma'am. Thank you. Jeff, I cannot cite the author nor the paper, but a paleoanthropologist friend uh, recently told me that we have 3% Neanderthal in our genomes, and it's higher in Asia than it is in Europe. What does that mean, and what do you think of that? Okay, well, I, we have to go back to how many specimens have yielded analyzable DNA. And compared to all of the fossils that we know of, there are very few. And, and you know, if, it was, if, a, if I was a giant, I would say a handful, because you could just put those Neanderthals and Paleolithic and these few other things in, in, in your hand. So we're not sampling everything that's there. Another thing that, um, there are a couple of things. <clears throat> how, how are evolutionary relationships or who's ancestral to whom or who's closest to whom, how are they generally sort of, how's that generally sort of approached? And what the modern, so-called modern evolutionary synthesis gave us was a Mendelized version of Darwinism. So the synthesis sort of melded or put together, uh, it, it, this began in the 1930s. Um, what was known of genetics at the time, which was just Mendelian genetics, like this gene is for that thing, and this gene is for this petal, and this is for that color. <clears throat> With Darwinism, which is that everything happened very slowly. If it didn't happen slowly, it happened continuously. So that you always had this smooth transition. So things are always changing through time. And that's what a lineage is. A lineage is actually this thing morphing through time. 
even if people break it up into species, because they don't really think these are separate species. How could they be if one is becoming it's something else? The first person to try to use molecules in phylogenetic uh, reconstruction um, was a British bacteriologist named Nuttall, George Nuttall. And he took samples of blood from a whole bunch of animals, vertebrates and invertebrates. And the serum of our blood um, contains a lot of proteins like hemoglobin. And we need hemoglobin to bind with oxygen in terms of energy, you know, getting oxy oxygen into our cells. So the, I, what was happening in the early 20th century, the turn of the century was people were look, getting into immunology. This is when you started to get that kind of research, it was possible. And so the notion was if you put blood serum from one animal with another one, their closeness and the relatedness would be uh, represented by how much interaction there was between the proteins of these two different species. The idea was the more closely related you are, the more they would, they would sort of fight, they would sort of bond and produce uh, this other substance. And then we're farther away, they, would, they wouldn't do that. In 1962, uh, Emmer Zuckelkondel, who was one of the fathers of molecular biology and biochemistry, and young Linus Pauling, who's known for um, polio vaccines, uh, published a paper on hemoglobin, which is, um, you know, the stuff that binds the oxygen. And they took samples from human, gorilla, horse, chicken, and fish. And so you have these different amounts of reactivity between humans and gorillas versus humans and fish. And they said, the degree of similarity reflects the degree of relatedness because molecules are constantly changing. So molecules are changing through a lineage. And when you get a diversification, that's when the molecular lineages change. So the earlier the divergence, the more time over which they accumulate different molecular states. And the more recent the uh, divergence, the more similar they're supposed to be. So that is basically the, how molecules are interpreted. And I think that's one of the reasons that the folks think, well, we don't need to know more from fossils because that's how molecules are. And because humans and Neanderthals are so similar, they must be closely related. Well, if you do the theory and practice of phylogenetic reconstruction um, on other animals, which is how I started out, not with I didn't want to touch a human fossil. I was just too much backstabbing and stuff. Um, in any case, one of the things that you learn is that similarity can be due to different, for different reasons. Something can be similar because they're very different. I mean, things are closely related. Or they can be similar because nothing changed. So in one way, you can say that a lot of the molecular similarities that are pointed to between the animals and humans are just because as sep these separate species inherited a lot of the same stuff. And since we don't have so many more fossils to compare this to, we can't test that. So the dominant idea that everything is changing and therefore the more similar you are, the more closely related and vice versa, dominates. The thing about that diagram I showed you that had the chimpanzee pan on one side and Neanderthals, the Denisovans and humans on the other is if molecules are, consist are constantly changing, how can the chimp sequence be used as the primitive sequence from which 
hominids evolved or changed. Also, how could the Neanderthal sequence be the primitive sequence from which we diverged? So there are all these sort of questions that I have um, that just don't get into the conversation because it just seems like everybody believes this is the way evolution works and this is how the molecules are supposed to be interpreted. I have a follow-up question, but I think there's somebody in the audience who has a question too, and maybe you should prioritize that. Maybe. Oh, oh you, actually, I, I, I see some here, uh, things on chat. Sorry, I, was, I mm -hmm. was looking at your images. Okay, thank you for your talk, very interesting, thank you. Something's not clear, that's not, I don't, forgive me, no, it's forgive me if I didn't make it clear. When you talk about homo sapiens not finding attractive a Neanderthal basically for their physical appearance, how can you relate this concept with modern mating preference that we see today in our society? First of all, homosexuality. Um, it's not made to preserve the species. Nevertheless, the fact, a fact you take. All right, so the, the thing is, um, there are competing ideas on species and how species become entities. And the one that is generally taught in biology classes and human evolution classes and stuff comes from the synthesis, which is that in order for species to begin to form, one population has to be divided into separate populations who are experiencing different ecological situations, causing them to then differ in the molecular or DNA or whatever you're looking at. Uh, and eventually they can't come together and reproduce. That model, even as popular as it remains, is an imposition on the organisms. It's something from the outside that is imposing on the organisms. In the 1980s, a fruit fly geneticist of all things, Patterson proposed the species mate recognition model. And this is individuals define their species by the sphere of whom they recognize as potential mates. Um, it doesn't preclude any other kind of sexuality. It's just that in terms of reproduction and um, uh, offspring, um, it would be individuals whose DNA needs to come together to form the offspring. So um, there are all sorts of things that, 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 that are not necessarily discussed when talking about species. And I didn't mean to or suggest that or imply that um, it's this bi binary sort of situation, but basically in the, concept, in the context of how do we perceive species, uh, which includes all the individuals with their individual ways of life within that species. Um, I hope I answered that question. Um, so basically, um, consideration when we talk about things that Homo sapiens finds attractive. Uh, well, I was talking about recognizing a potential mate. Um, what's really sort of interesting is that some of the people are now talking about this that the only way in which uh, they're the, the framing this human Neanderthal interbreeding is by rape, um, which is a, one way of saying they are so different that if they did come upon each other as reproductive alternative uh, opposites, um, they wouldn't recognize each other as mates, but somehow they did because the molecules tell us that they did. That's the thing, the molecules are telling us how to think about this stuff not thinking about the molecules in the context of the broader biology of life. So, um, and whatever is attractive in, in some sense is, is also cultural. So, um, you, I'm not talking about attractive in terms of, I, I don't even know how to say it. Um, I'm just talking about individuals recognizing other individuals as or not as potential mates. And that's it. Whatever the attraction is, is not, is not 
it's a different level. And I think that's where the so culture and sociology um, of, of different uh, groups of living humans comes into play. And that's how we can understand why some people think something is attractive that other people don't. And that's, that's just everyday life. Okay, uh, would you like to comment on human diseases that some research say were contributed by Neanderthals, like tendencies to addiction, addiction behavior, also tendencies in depression. Can we say we inherited Neanderthal behaviors? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's hard to get into the mind of an extinct species. And, you know, I've even for years had cats and I've never been able to figure out their minds, um, but they've been able to figure out mine, I guess. There, the notion that there is a gene for something specific goes back to Mendel's experiments with sweet peas and the early um, uh, um, population genetic studies that informed the synthesis. And people still tend to think that there are genes for specific things, whether they be physical features, emotional things, um, behavioral things or, or whatever. I'm inclined to believe that all hominins, as we know from our ape relatives, um, had a wide range of emotions. And there, there are some things that see, that be, where a specific gene has been identified as part of what is expressed, but it doesn't mean there's a gene for that. So um, it's really partly genetic and what's called epigenetic. It's the external factors that are influencing how the molecules that you have express in different sorts of ways. Um, having done a lot of research on orangutans, uh, going back to the earlier, even early literature of the 30s and 40s, people talked about, Neander uh, about orangutans seemingly being depressed. And when a female lost her child, um, just this expression that even the caretakers could perceive. And the same thing with chimps, they carry the dead child around for a while. Um, so I think that we just sort of are, we think of ourselves more or less as the pinnacle, but I think we share a lot of things with animals that we don't understand, and that includes for our fossil relatives. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have room for one more question? You have room for many more questions. Thank you. Uh, Edo, do we have more questions in the chat box? We, not, we have one from YouTube, okay. but, but I think ahead. we can Go prioritize ahead. your question. No, no, no. Do the, do the one on YouTube. All right, all right. So Clark Blount, Blount, or Blount asks, have there been any differences found within Neanderthal DNA along the lines of human haplogroup? I think he means haplogroup. I'm sorry, human what? Human, what's this? Haplogroup, I think you wrote. Haplogroup. Haplogroups. Yeah. Okay. So haplogroups are sort of so-called molecular markers. And haplo means single. Um, so it's, it's like a single expression of some molecular state. Um, Some of the more recent literature that I've read from the molecular side of things, not from human evolutionary sources, but from molecular biology, is even questioning the veracity or, or the reality and the, um, the um, utility of uh, conceiving haplotypes. Uh, everybody likes to sort of put uh, everything in a, in a, in a 
place. You want you want to have you want to define something. You want some things. In, in some ways, it's almost a justification for existence. So people are looking for things that might be characteristic of this population, that population, or whatever else. First of all, you have to ask the question: How was that population originally defined? Because they all came from the same island, um, because they came from the same house, because your neighbor said go down the street. Um, you have to sort of consider how how this came about. So. I remain sort of now on the fence uh, with this debate that's emerging amongst molecular biologists and molecular evolutionists about the um, stability of these things that are identified as haplotypes, which would be this particular molecular marker is for this group of individuals. And how do you start breaking up the human, pop, the, all homo sapiens? Do you do it by Asia? That doesn't make any sense. Do you do it by Sub-Saharan Africa? That doesn't necessarily make any sense either. You certainly wouldn't do it in North America. So um, again, I think that people are searching for something that's concrete. People wanna have an answer, but um, it's more difficult to say, I don't know at the time, and it might be um, require more research. So um, I don't know whether that helped you, uh, but uh, there is this recent research which is questioning the existence of haplotypes as real permanent markers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope it did help, uh, sir or Ms. Clark. All right, um, I'll pass on the floor to Ma'am Mylene. For thank questions. you. Uh, I suspect my question is a simplified version of that question. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask, you know, with all the, the, the discussions on human evolution and the, the models that have been presented from the beginning, and uh, of course, the newer models that are more branching out more than linear as it was in the past. Uh, from a physical anthropologist's perspective, what does it mean to be homo sapiens in terms of morphology? Oh, that's a good I question. That's the simplistic. That that is a that is um, a million dollar question. Um, the father of modern day taxonomy uh, was Linnaeus, whose actual real name was Carl von Linné. But since everybody wrote science in Latin, his name was Linnaeus. In 1735, Linnaeus published his first edition of this approach to taxonomy, where he classified as many plants and animals um, as were brought to his attention. Uh, he lived in Stockholm, and so this was a major trading port, and seafarers and sailors and stuff would come in with weird specimens and other sorts of things and bring the Linnaeus, who was known as his taxonomist. Um, it was Linnaeus who introduced what's called the binomial nomenclature, which is that every entity is defined by a species and a genus. So effectively, uh, this is like um, a Chinese representation of a name. The family name is the genus, and the species name is specific to what's subsumed within the genus. And one of the things that Linnaeus required of taxonomists was that you had to present at least one defining feature of a genus and its species or different species as they became identified. Even if they were sort of what we consider now to be um, irrelevant, at least this was an approach to try to get um, a uh, formalized way of doing taxonomy because otherwise taxonomists were doing whatever they wanted. There was no regularized way of doing this, no way of testing these, these proposals. The one thing that Linnaeus didn't do was to provide any information for Homo sapiens, which is the genus and species he named in 1735, the first edition of his taxonomy. Instead, he used the Latin phrase, nosce te ipsum, which means know thyself. <laughs> 
So it's basically, I look around and I say, well, all of us here on this uh, Zoom conference, we're homo sapiens because I get it, you know, uh, know thyself, you look like me, generally enough, whatever. So from the very beginning, even before evolutionary things became part of the uh, discourse uh, and the Neanderthals cropped on the scene, um, there was no definition of either the genus or the species. Um, and that still sort of plagues us because um, of the history that I, I hope I presented clearly to you as to how these specimens were crammed into so few taxa. Uh, a taxon is any taxonomic rank, species or genus, and the plural of taxon is taxa. So the history of Homo sapiens studies, if you go back to the more recent parts of the history I reviewed, is the removal of things from Homo sapiens. In other words, Neanderthals were lumped with us, these Hadobergensis things, whatever they are, were lumped with us. And then people said, these are really different. So we have to call it some archaic and some anatomically modern. So this, what's left in, in sapiens is what's left over after Neanderthals and these Hadrobergensis things were removed. And that leaves a lot of stuff still in there that doesn't look like anything else. Um, so I've been trying to, so attempts at uh, defining at least the species sapiens, um, Chris Stringer and, and colleagues back in 1984, try to offer some features that are distinctive of us. And they said, well, this two-part two brow that we have and a chin, um, that, may be a big, that may be defining features of Homo sapiens, but not everyone has it. So what I've been proposing and I've, I've written about, I published one paper on trying to define Homo sapiens and I'm working on another one right now, um, I think we have to start with us. We, we know we're homo sapiens. Now we have to work hard to see what features really do distinguish us as a species. And then having done that, at least as a testable hypothesis, start to look at the other specimens which have been left over and still called homo sapiens, which don't have our features at all. What's very interesting, that's, uh, if I may, when I gave you, the, show that slide on um, the specimens from the Mount Carmel Caves in Israel, the orangey specimen on the left is definitely a Neanderthal. And the one on the right, um, in 1934, uh, some of the school specimens had been found. Uh, the taboo and stuff had not. And Arthur Keith published uh, an article on the school specimens in, in, in October 1934, I think it's October, issue of um, Illustrated London Times. And he gave these features of that school five specimen, the one in that slide that everybody trots out as Homo sapiens, as, as a fossil Homo sapiens. Big face, big protrusive face. Um, big brow, continuous across orbits and across the nasal region that just are not Homo sapiens. That's why he initially put them into Paleoanthropus palestinus, and then eventually that was changed to Paleoanthropo, Paleoanthropus palestinus as a separate species and even a separate genus. But once you remove Neanderthals and Heidelbergensis, school and other non-sapiens looking things stay there. There's so much known about this, this school specimen. Not only did it have this big protruding face that we don't have, not only did it have this continuous bar-like brow that went from side to side, but there's a linguist, uh, Philip Lieberman, who, studied the, who studies vocal cords and the vocalizing chamber uh, in terms of the origin of speech. And he pointed out, if, you're, if your face is out here, that means your palate is very long and your mandible is very long as well, which are not our features. He, uh, Lieberman pointed out that 
the palate in this specimen was not only very long, it was shallow. If you move your tongue up into your palate, it fits into this depression. So we don't have a flat palate and we have a very short palate with a bunched tongue. Another part of our being able to articulate the sounds that we do, which is different from language or speech, is the position of the only bone in our body that doesn't articulate or meet up with another bone. And that's the hyoid bone in the neck, in the, in the throat cartilages. <clears throat> in order for us to get the diversity of, of different sounds that we can make, it's not only the movement of our short, bunched up, chunky tongue, but it's the movement of the hyoid bone, which changes the volume in our voice box. What Lieberman found out when he reconstructed the skull of the school of five specimen with its neck vertebrae and clavicles, because it's a fairly complete skeleton, is that its hyoid bone would have been below the collarbones or clavicles, which means that it would not have moved with the same freedom that ours does. So going back to the 30s with Keith saying, this face doesn't look like Homo sapiens, and Lieberman stuff from the 70s saying, well, the rest of this doesn't, isn't Homo sapiens, just gets sort of tossed away because of history and received wisdom. School five, I think, will always be Homo sapiens no matter what anybody says. Thank you, Jeff. Fascinating. I have so many more questions, but uh, of course, I know it's late evening there, and um, it's been we've been running more than an hour. Edo, do we have any more questions in the chat box? Um, none. But can I ask one very simple question? You can ask oh, anything you want. Yes. All right. So, um, hold on. Um, I study I studied sociology in my undergraduate, and now I'm taking up sociology as well. And I notice we have a lot of sociology undergraduates in our audiences. And um, how would you how would you uh, say what if like some of us wanted to collaborate with um, archaeologists? Um, how would what would be a good starting point for um, young sociologists or history majors or philosophy majors to collaborate with archaeologists. Well, if you're, if you're talking about archaeologists, you should ask the archaeologists. OK. Uh, if you want to talk about generally human evolution, it would be, I would say, first, just Google thoughts and see what article titles pop up uh, that sort of have things that might in intersect with your interests, and then you can take it from there. Um, it's very difficult to reconstruct the behavior of extinct entities. You know, dinosaurs have been known since the, since, since the 1600s, actually, uh, when fossils were first identified as the, as the rock hard remains of once living animals. Um, even Neanderthals, um, it's been slow over the decades in terms of trying to figure out their, in the way they viewed the world, the way they interacted with one another. So going back into the 1980s, um, archaeologists were writing about how, given the way in which the cave sites in which Neanderthals uh, lived, and given how they constructed that living space, versus how Upper Paleolithic archeological sites show Upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens using their space, Neanderthals, per Neanderthals perceive space differently. So, you know, you could try to wrap your brain around that and sort of say, well, what are the extensions of that? Um, I think the, um, even though people say in passing in the literature that Neanderthals like, like almost every other hominin uh, were hunter-gatherers, it, it really just is sort of like a throwaway line. 
And what I was trying to show with that in terms of this the group behavior of, of hunter gatherers, um, what that really is like. So I, I think if you know you're more sophisticated at this than I am, clearly as I couldn't even open my PowerPoint, but um, you could search ideas that you find interesting and add something about the, the evolutionary aspect of it or the fossil evidence or the archeological evidence in support of it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, may I have a, a last question if? Uh, of course. No one else has. <laughs> um, this goes a bit uh, in, into the uh, let's let's say behavioral capacities that that we attribute or, or not attribute to Neanderthals, respectively, early Homo sapiens. Um, when I was in 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 Bonn at that time, I. I, I worked together with uh, Ralf Schmitz and Jürgen Thyssen, who, who were heading the re-excavation of the Feldhofer Grotto, the spoil heap. Mm -hmm. and, and they found a, a lot of material. So they found, I, th I think, uh, uh, human fossil fragments that would fit to the original, to the type fossil, plus, I think, evidence for two more individuals. And, and they found um, quite an, a lot of stone tools, uh, which didn't receive that much press, but, but they were really fascinating. And so I, I, was, um, I was doing for them the, the microscopic user analysis mm. of those stone tools. And um, <clears throat> among them, or the, the dominant part, was a, a very intriguing assemblage of uh, 60 <clears throat> artifacts that, that fall into the type of uh, scrapers type Groshak is, is the, the formal name, I think. And, and they are geometric micro tools. They are very circular, very regular round shaped uh, scrapers. They are completely um, modified, retouched, so to speak. They have not been reduced in their size by uh, attrition. They were really made to that size. And the smallest uh, in the assemblage was just had a diameter of seven millimeter the largest, I think, 16 millimeter. So technically, they, they would qualify very well as microliths that mm -hmm. would appear, of course, in, in the same area much, much later. Um, and I, I was wondering, I mean, making those uh, tools is quite challenging. So you need really a lot of, of I think, uh, uh, precision uh, motoric capacities and, and the, I mean, all of them were used. So they also used them. Some of them were used uh, as hafted tools. So we found residues of, of uh, hafting bloom. And uh, I was then wondering, so because during that, it was even very difficult to put them under the microscope because they were so small, that mm. how, how were they able to, to make those very fine, uh, small tools and when, when you showed uh, uh, in one of your slides that uh, the thumb of uh, Neanderthals was considerably longer than of, of Homo sapiens, then I remember that study. And so I was wondering, is there any, any relation to, to that? Or? No, uh, you know, um, going back to the 70s, I guess, when early the Australopiths, Australopithecus and the like were really accepted as things. And people were into, did they have a precision grip? In other words, could they do this? And if they couldn't do this, they couldn't do the manipulation necessary to produce the finer tools like the ones you're talking about. Um, I think it's within the last four years. Uh, there's a, a really good biological anthropologist, Katerina Harvati at Tübingen. And she co-authored a paper on the musculature that would attach to these various thumbs, Neanderthal, I think it was Neanderthals versus us. And it could, their, their range of motion and everything they could do was comparable, they figured out, they hypothesized based on the muscular attachments and the way in the muscle scars that are left on the bones um, as us. Um, 
aren't a lot of, uh, so years ago when I was a graduate student, um, did you ever hear of Donald Crabtree? Yeah. Donald Crabtree was one of these archeologists who actually studied with the last uh, living Aboriginal Native American, um, how to make tools. And so he, he gave a seminar or a course actually on all the she had I remember for, for doing that. And um, so since this is not my, my, my main focus, what I have been thinking about, because there, <clears throat> there have been some articles recently about <clears throat> the stone tools, uh, whether, you know, there really isn't this defined association of Neanderthals with Mysterian and Upper Paleolithic with Ordnacean and so on that has become part of received wisdom. Um, but I thought about these little microlith things and that they might in fact be part of the debitage, you know, part of what's thrown off in the production of something larger and then just used. I, uh, that's, that's my naive take on it. Um, but I think the main thing is that um, unless you actually find a fossil um, with something in its hand, you don't always know who made it because there's, there's, there are many more archeological sites than there are human fossil uh, bearing sites. I, that was a very vague answer because I don't have a very clear answer. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, it it was at, at that time. Um, I think there was still the, the debate about uh, the the so-called um, modern package of, of the behavioral modernity yes. package that was brought from Homo sapiens uh, into Europe, and in, in order to explain their success uh, over the, right. the the resident Neanderthals. That's right. That's why there was this big distinction between Neanderthals and the Mousterian versus um, these earlier Homo sapiens and so-called more sophisticated technologies. Um, in some cases, I think it's, it's you use what you have when you need it kind of thing. So that um, when I've been various places looking at the fossils uh, and archeologists have sort of shown me some of the stone tools that are contemporaneous, not necessarily associated with the fossils, is that some of the raw material you would never go out and seek to use, but if that's really all you have in, within your, your sphere, you use it. And the material I think then sort of limits or expands the array of things that you can produce from it. That's sort of my general under, understanding of it, which may not be correct. Mm. It, it was at, at the same time, or a, a year or two earlier, that um, I was working with uh, Jürgen Thyssen. He had, a, he had a different side. He was doing a lot of um, rescue archaeology al along those lignite mining fields uh, west of, of Bonn. Mm -hmm. And he had a fascinating uh, open site that was, of course, under constant threat by, by the, the, uh, the back hose uh, of the mining area. And eventually the site disappeared. But uh, because of an upgrade of, of those gigantic uh, bucket excavators, he had time to excavate one side a bit uh, more carefully. And it was about 100 to, to 120,000 years old. Uh, no, no fossils or only, only stone tools. But uh, um, the dating was, was pretty clear. It, it, was, uh, it was in the, the Eemian layers, and there was a, a, a luminescence uh, date associated of, of roughly 100,000 years. Um, but the assemblage looked relatively modern, for, so to speak. So there was a lot of blades, really uh, good blade technology. Uh, you had the cores. Uh, they had grinding stones, which is extremely rare to find. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I like the assemblage very much. We found evidence for um, birch tower production. So they, they, they used a lot of those tools, halved So we, we had evidence for, for all those uh, modern technologies that, that uh, Klein and, and Mellars or so would uh, cite as, as um, part of the modern package of Homo sapiens. And we, we had it there uh, 100,000 years. Uh, uh, ago, 
so that was that was quite a interesting thing, and it it also showed that it's it's not really that uh, such a clear cut and and so easy to to separate. And, and well, uh, the oldest um, the oldest Homo sapiens remains from Europe or from that recently excavated site I, I, I showed you where there was Neanderthal Homo sapiens going back and forth uh, is 48 to 54,000 years ago. So clearly, uh, even though it pushes back the presence of Homo sapiens by seven or 8,000 years, uh, 100,000 years is quite mm -hmm. far away. So I think we really have to expand our um, our narrow-mindedness. Um, and, and I think also there's this idea that Homo sapiens can, is, is the pinnacle and we do all the great stuff and that no one, none of the other species could. Um, so I, I, basically I like stories like, I like examples like that. Yeah, me too. Uh, talking about what, what, what do you make out of uh, the the site in Greece that was recently reported, I think by, by Katrina Harvati, that, that is, uh, a, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he was in Tübingen and more recently, 200,000 years? 100. For yeah. Homo sapiens? Yeah. yeah. Homo sapiens one. Um, you can call almost anything Homo sapiens if you choose the right specimens. And there are so many specimens in sapiens now, even with Neanderthals and Hydropagensis material removed. Um, you know, it's like, it's like a, basically it's like a wastebasket. Um, the more you put different things in it and you look in it, you say, look how variable that species is. Um, there was just some cranial bones as far as I remember. And I remember not being uh, convinced that they were homo sapiens. Um, so another thing that, that this, the, the way in which human evolution has been conceived is that um, there may have been, you know, people allow there to have been a lot of taxonomic diversity in the past. But the closer you get to the present, people are denying that possibility. Uh, and some of that, I think, is just the historical coincidence that we're one of the rare species existing that doesn't have a closely related species coexisting with us. So we have this very strange view of ourselves. And the idea that the closer you get to the present, the more you get you know, the so-called modern packages and the like you don't get different uh, taxa, but we're animals. And you know, the, the, um, the molecular work on how development of organisms happens uh, is suggesting all the time that changes are really very stochastic. And um, rather than, than selection, choosing things that are gonna become you know, beneficial for the organism under those circumstances, um, the molecular biology development suggests that um, there would be these revolutions in, in organic, organismal organization. Um, so it has nothing to do with this divergence or being in different ecological zones uh, that you would get species divergence. Um, so I think that the people are, are sort of overlooking the uh, potential of toxic diversity really very close to the present. Uh, one of the skulls that, that I showed in the slide, this is the Homo sapiens group. There would be more specimens that I could have added to that. There was that brown skull that was, I put closer to us. And that's from a site in South Africa called Fishhook, which was recently um, calibrated to just under 7,000 years ago. And it doesn't have our features. Um, is it a different species? Well, you know, people would think I'm crazy if I said yes, definitively. But I think that um, as, as these small groups uh, were, that 
there's no reason there couldn't have been co uh, up until recently coexisting different species, and we just happen to be the survivors. So um, that's kind of what I think how people are looking at this material. Uh, Hugh Bland published uh, an article maybe, I don't know, five, seven years ago on new material from Morocco from the site of Jebel Irhud. Uh, and they redated it to close to 300 to 315,000 years ago. And they said it's the oldest Homo sapiens. Well, it doesn't look like us at all. It has a bar like uh, brow um, and other things about it. Um, but once you start calling those things Homo sapiens and people say yes, then you broaden the sphere of Homo sapiens so you could put anything in it. And I, I say we start from scratch. I think we should just throw away all these names all that sort of stuff. Treat these as fossils that were all found yesterday and we don't know anything about them uh, and, and build it up that way. Thank you. I, I, would, yeah, I would like that approach. <laughs> um, that is so radical. <laughs> it's awesome. Everybody can engage in it. The thing is that um, when I lecture, uh, and this was more of a, a historical lecture than a fossil lecture. I try to use as many images as possible because you don't have to know the terminology. I mean, we all have eyes. We all appreciate similarity and difference. Um, so it, it's not like the secret society that paleoanthropologists and molecular anthropologists have sort of constructed. And there's this comment saying, thank you for the excellent talk. I learned a lot and I really thank you for being in the audience and um, hanging in there. Uh, th thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much for, for really sharing uh, all your knowledge and, and this amazing story uh, with us. And, and this, despite uh, being quite late uh, at your place, so uh, thanks that we, we, we were allowed to take all your time uh, for this it lecture. My pleasure. This was uh, a real uh, challenge and it, it, with the invitation. Uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, put it get, oh, together. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, this is a real treat. So I hope, that, um, I hope that we can carry on and I hope that I can come visit and uh, meet all of you who are in the region uh, and carry on these conversations. We look forward to that. Thank you so much, Thank Jeff. You. I really am so grateful. Thank you for making it possible for us in the Philippines to experience this lecture of yours. We are truly grateful for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. It's a fascinating Thank talk. Thank you. Thank you all. And yeah, hopefully see you very soon here. In yes. Person and, I uh, hope so. I hope so. We can talk a lot more. That would be wonderful. Excellent. I would enjoy that very much. So it's getting close to midnight where Jeff is. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, it's, a quarter, it's a quarter to 10. So. Um, oh, only uh, my, my time zones are wrong. <laughs> I, I am so bad with time zones. But, uh, this, this was really exciting. It sort of revved me up and I enjoyed all the questions. So it makes me think a lot. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, what a privilege that we are the first ones to, to listen to this lecture of yours. My, my, you. pleasure. my pleasure. Okay, thank you very much again. And thanks to the audience. Thank you for joining us and for being with us on this webinar. It was really very exciting and uh, such a great pleasure to have you here, Jeff. Thank you. My pleasure as well. Thank you all very much. Thank so, you. Good night, Jeff. Thank you. And all of you have a good day. <laughs> Before we close the webinar, may I just announce uh, the speaker for our next webinar? That's on March 1, uh, I think at 2 p.m. Uh, Manila time. It will be our own John Peterson from the University of San Carlos, who will introduce us to 
reading with Zion landscapes and the environmental history and archaeology in the central Philippines. So I hope to see you all there. And until then, have a great time. And thank you for joining. Thank you, Jeff, again. Right. Have a good time and see you soon, hopefully. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.